Hey friend, when was the last time you listened to a podcast that told you everything you needed to know to break into or do your work in the field of continuing medical education and continuing education for health professionals? If it's been a hot minute, or like never, you've arrived at the right podcast. In fact, you've arrived at Right Medicine, a weekly podcast that explores best practices in creating content that connects with and educates health professionals. Are you feeling stuck in your work? Are you looking for inspiration from your peers? Are you looking for a way to break into this incredibly rewarding and intellectually satisfying field? Well, Right Medicine is here to offer you guidance and strategies as you navigate all phases of CME and CE creation. Every Wednesday, join me, Alex Housen, a medical writer specializing in CME and CE content creation as I host thoughtful, provocative, and rich conversations with guests about adult learning, content creation techniques, effective formats in CME and CE, and trends in healthcare that influence the type of content we create. Right Medicine is here to motivate you to learn and grow as a CME and CE professional, wherever you are in the content creation process. If your work involves planning, designing, creating, delivering or evaluating education for health professionals. This podcast is for you. Back in 1992, I landed my first faculty position at the University of Edinburgh. And my first gig involved teaching introductory sociology of gender to well over 200 undergraduate students, maybe more, I forget. (laughs) All lecture based, of course. I was really nervous. I paced the stage. I got tangled up in the wires of my radio mic and at one point flipped my pen out into the auditorium as I waved my arms around to emphasize a point about, I don't know, second wave feminist materialism. At some point, I was introduced to effective teaching in higher education by George Brown and Madeline Atkins and learned that I could actually sprinkle little activities into large group teaching and learning scenarios. I could use activities like think, pair and share or take polls with a show of hands. These and other activities became my go-to resources to spice up teaching. But while there are so many other activities that educators can use to make learning active, the adoption of active learning strategies in CME and CE has been frustratingly slow. For instance, Graham McMahon lamented a knowledge gap about use of all active learning strategies across medical education in a 2015 Journal of the American Medical Association article. And so I'm really excited to have today's conversation with Barbie Honeycutt, a faculty development consultant and host of the podcast Lecture Breakers. We discuss activities that work in adult learning and professional development settings like CME and CE to ensure that what we're sharing with learners in healthcare is very relevant and practical, that health professionals can actually use what they're learning in their clinical practice. And before we jump into our conversation, I wanted to give a wee shout out to Alison Kickle, who is president of Bonham CE. Alison is a podcast listener and was a guest in an earlier season. And she says, I swear I could listen to you read package inserts and be engaged, but then you go and have such thoughtful questions and interesting guests. I'm honoured to be part of that cadre. Well, thanks, Alison, for being a listener and for sharing your wisdom and insights with all of us in the Right Medicine community, a place where you can learn about what your peers in CME and CE are doing and hear from experts in the wider world of adult learning professional development and clinical care. So put the kettle on or set out for a walk and join me and Barbie to explore things you can try in your live or live online sessions right away. Welcome, Barbie. Thank you so much for having me on the podcast. It's so great to be here. Yeah, good to see you and good to have you here. So please tell listeners who you are and a little bit about your professional journey. Yeah, so I have been working in uh, faculty development for, oh my gosh, 21 Mm -hmm. years now, which is amazing. I started as an intern in the Teaching and Learning Center on the campus when I was a master's student and didn't realize that it would shape Mm -hmm. my entire 
career path uh, at that time. And that's when I really learned all about professional development for professors, educators, and teachers. I didn't really know that world existed. And that is what I found myself falling in love with. I just really enjoy working with professors and educators, trainers, uh, anyone who teaches. That is like, those are my people. <laughs> so you, yeah. I'm always looking, yeah, I'm always looking for ways to support them mm -hmm. in their work and uh, help them be successful in the classroom. And so I did that work in a university for a little yeah. over a yeah, decade. Yeah. And now for the last 10 years, I've been doing it independently as a consultant. I'm also a speaker and an author, and I'm also a podcaster. Mm -hmm. And so now I'm able to work with faculty from all over the world. I enjoyed working with faculty at one campus, but it's it's kind of awesome to be able to work with faculty from a variety of disciplines and campuses, and that's always fun. So mm -hmm. that's a little bit about what I've been doing for the last couple of decades, I guess. <laughs> yeah, well, great context and great story there. And I've been listening to your podcast, and I'll obviously put a link in the show notes to your podcast because it's a really wonderful resource for anybody who is, as you put it, supporting faculty and supporting educators in the work that they're doing, regardless of their their setting. Obviously, the audience for Right Medicine, you know, that setting is professional development and continuing medical education for health professionals. But I think there's some really great tools in many of the episodes of your podcast. So I'll make sure to link to that. And I remember that exposure to learning and, and professional development when I was a, a young uh, faculty at the University of Edinburgh, which is where I started out my professional academic and uh, teaching and learning journey. And it was such a relief to actually be exposed to people who provided tools and resources to help me think about how I was going to teach. Because if you don't have that, it's it can be really daunting to kind of figure out how am I going to teach this class of 200 <laughs> undergraduates mm -hmm. about sociology 101, which is where I started my, my own kind of teaching and learning journey. So one of the things you talk about a lot in your podcast is active learning. And that, that seems to be kind of one of the defining concepts of the work that you do. So what are we talking about when we're talking about active learning? Yeah. So my podcast is called Lecture Breakers. Okay. So it is all about breaking up these long lectures where they're just so perfectly well-polished and well-prepared and you've, you've prepared all of your slides and everything is set up and ready to go. And then here I come along saying, hey, I want you to break that up. I want you to you know, try something different if you can, because what we know about student learning and whether your students are you know, college students or whether they are learners in a professional setting, what we know about how people learn is that we really do need to break up these long presentations. We need to give our audience time to process, time to think, time to reflect, time to apply what they're learning, and even just to hit the pause for a moment so that they can kind of take in and reflect on it and figure out, you know, how it relates to them, especially in the context, I think, of your audience. Mm -hmm. you know, when we're working with adult learners, we want mm -hmm. to make sure that what we're sharing with them is very relevant and practical and they can actually use it. And so with active learning, and you're right, that's like my mission in life is all about active <laughs> learning. And and really, it's it's just it just comes down to asking yourself, you know, what are my learners going to do? Like, we always go in to a presentation or a lecture or demonstration or a seminar. And if we're the ones that are sort of on the stage, so to speak, you know, we, we tend to lead with what am I going to say, mm -hmm. <laughs> right? Or mm -hmm. what am I going to talk about? And so I'm, I'm challenging the audience and the listeners to flip that question around and say, no, wait a minute, what, what are, what's my audience going to do? What are my learners going to do? And that moves you from a place of talking at your audience and your learners to a place of really like connecting with them. And that really changes that one little question changes how you approach your planning. And you, you go into a mode of like, no, I, I want to be, I want them to be actively engaged, whatever that looks like for you. It could be as simple as, you know, pausing your lecture at the 12 minute mark or whatever and saying, okay, I want mm -hmm. you to write for one minute about one concept that you take away from what we've done so far. 
or it could be now we'll just get into groups and we're going to apply this to a situation. Anywhere, anything where you're moving from that passive receiving of information to actively somehow doing something with it. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And, and you, you talked about, well, obviously you're called lecture breakers. And so in that live setting, that in-person setting, which obviously there's been a lot of disruption to that over the last three years. But I think in, in my world, in continuing medical education, we're beginning to see the return of live meetings and satellite symposia and all these kind of in-place, in-person contexts where there is going to be some kind of formal learning involving faculty on a stage talking about things. And I really like that you are able to kind of provide these, you know, relatively simple activities for people to do just to kind of break up the the fire hose of information that, Mm -hmm. you know, we often kind of find in these settings where they're still very presentation or sometimes demonstration focused. Can you share any other kind of examples, particularly in a you know, professional con- conference setting or an annual meeting setting where maybe it's a very large crowd of two, three hundred people, maybe even more of things that might work to really stimulate active learning in that kind of context? Yeah, yeah. And I think I want to also say too that with active learning, it's not a one size fits all and, and not all active learning strategies are what I call equal. So I like to think of it sort of as a continuum of active learning strategies, if you will. I kind of break it down in terms of what I call low intensity. And then at the other end of the the continuum would be high intensity. So Mm -hmm. low intensity activities would be things that take minimal prep time, like less than 10 minutes for you to prepare and be ready to go. Take minimal time to do. It might be a a two minute activity in your lecture. So if you're Mm -hmm. feeling that pressure that you have to you know, cover all the material, then, Mm -hmm. you know, that we can have a whole separate conversation about coverage versus, you know, actual connection and engagement. But, Mm -hmm. you know, if you're feeling that pressure, like I have to get through this material, then, you know, a low intensity active learning strategy can take minimal time to do still very, very effective. It also has low intensity activities allow you to keep what I'm going to call control, and I'm kind of thinking air quotes here with control, Mm -hmm. you're not going to lose control of your audience or your learners. Like they're not going to just go wild and leave the classroom and everything. But it does, when you're doing a low intensity activity, you know, like what question you're going to ask, like maybe you're going to do a quiz question. That's a Mm -hmm. low intensity activity. Maybe it's a clicker question. Maybe it's just walking around, listening, listening to the groups, have a conversation, little things like that allow you to kind of check in, you see where your audience is, where your learners are, and then you move on. So you kind Mm -hmm. of control that environment. Now, on the other end of this is what we call, or what I'm calling a high intensity activity. Now, these would be things that are the opposite of that, right? They take more time to prepare. Sometimes they could take hours to prepare. Mm -hmm. They take more time to do. Sometimes a high intensity active learning strategy, like doing a very involved case study Mm -hmm. or a project-based learning experience, or even a complex game, role playing, things like that, they could take, you know, hours or days or semester to plan and even could be done throughout a whole semester and take that long to actually do where the students Mm -hmm. are on this journey throughout a whole semester or even a a week or a day. So, you know, I just wanted to kind of clarify kind of how I'm breaking down uh, what I mean by active learning, because there's so many different kinds of active Mm -hmm. learning strategies out there. And so, to go to your question about, you know, some examples, I guess, some examples of a low intensity strategy that could easily be done in a large lecture hall or in a professional setting at a conference. And I have an, I have an example I'll explain in a moment. You know, you could do something as simple as pausing your lecture midway through or your presentation or your demonstration and doing a think pair share or a write pair mm-hmm. share since this mm-hmm. is a writing podcast, you know, where you ask the audience literally a question. And maybe they think about it or write about it for one minute. And mm-hmm. then they work with a pair and they discuss it. They're in, in, in pairs and say, you know, what, what's your response to this? You know, you give them another two minutes to share with each other. And then you share as a whole group. That's where mm-hmm. you as the facilitator, you know, can call on people and make connections between different pairs, look for trends, observations. You could even have them, if you wanted to, report out on a 
on a, uh, a Google Doc or some kind of collaborative document if you if you wanted to make that learning visible. Mm-hmm. Uh, so there's a lot you can do there, and it doesn't take a lot of coordination, and it doesn't take a lot of time. You can do that in five minutes, that whole thing <laughs> from yeah, start to yeah, finish. Yeah. <laughs> so those are the lower intensity things, and and there's a lot there. I mean, it could you could lead with a quiz question, a true false question, a what do you think question, a continuum. I, you know, there's so many mm-hmm. things you could do, and those are quick. And they're just like bursts of, of energy that you're kind of throwing out there to the audience. And then you'll see the energy change in the room when, when mm-hmm. you do that. You'll see them get engaged and pay attention. <laughs> now, the high intensity side, I actually have a, a story that I can share that I did at a conference. I was facilitating and invited to do a, a pre-conference workshop at a, at a major national conference. And there were probably maybe 80 people in the room. So not mm-hmm. 200, but still a big group for a pre-conference workshop. And what I actually did, you know, my topic was on what I call focusing activities, which are things that you can do in the first five minutes of class to focus your students' attention Mm -hmm. on the topic. Like, what's the topic? Instead of, you know, using that first five minutes to, you know, say, okay, here are the important announcements. Don't forget about the test on Friday. Don't forget you had a homework assignment. Like, instead of using that valuable time for those kind of announcements, use it to actually jump into the content. Mm -hmm. And so what I did is once I sort of opened with a less than 10 minute lecture and explaining what a a focusing activity is, I actually turned it over to them to work in groups of three to four. And they actually created their own focusing activity. So they had to, you know, their, their, their charge was what I said was, Hey, we are going to create a website for faculty who are attending this conference. What do you want to put on it so that they know, since they couldn't attend this session, what do you think is important for them to know about this topic? And I let them go. And it was amazing. Mm -hmm. I got some groups created infographics about like, here's 10 types of, of focusing activities you can use. Some groups created, I had one group that went out of the room and I was, they were like, Barbie, we'll be right back. And I was like, okay. (laughs) And they went and recorded a little podcast episode. Oh, wow. And that was fantastic. And so, you know, they actually did a little interview, set it up as if one was the host and one was the guest and recorded a whole podcast episode. I had someone else do, they worked together to write a blog post, like here's five tips for starting your class. So what I ended up with was this library, this this like collection of artifacts, I'll mm-hmm. call it, from the faculty who are the professionals mm-hmm. <laughs> who are mm-hmm. sharing this work and what they learned with their colleagues. And they asked me all kinds of questions throughout the process. I was there facilitating that, but I wasn't lecturing to everyone. I was there when they needed me and they went ahead with their project. Mm-hmm. And I did go and create the website for them and I put up wow. all of their resources and we had it there for them to share. And it was amazing. And I think two or three years later, I went to that same conference as a vendor and someone came up and said, I attended your session and I remember doing the podcast, you know. <laughs> so I guess that's what I'm saying is like really thinking about, you know, what is it that you want your your audience, your participants or your colleagues to do? do Mm -hmm. in that time you have with them? What's going to be the most valuable takeaway for them? So I'll pause there. Yeah, example. (laughs) I I love that. And I have a couple of questions. So I mean, first of all, that's a great example of what the constructionists call Mm co-creation. You know, that idea that you are kind of building content together in a way that draws on everybody's sort of pre-existing experience and expertise. But my question is, and you may have said this and I missed it, So did you provide an introduction to what a focusing activity is or with with any sort of boundaries or parameters? Or did you just, you know, how how did you how did you introduce the activity that you were asking them to do? Yes. So I did. I did give Mm. them a 10, 12 minute, you know, lecture, walk them through you know, this is what it is, but then it was very guided. So I right. I, give, I gave them what I call guided notes, which I'm sure your audience has heard of, just basically an outline of, you know, what the topic was. They filled that in. They came up with their own pros and cons, advantages and disadvantages to it. So we really constructed that, as you say, together. But yes, I did lead with an opening activity as well as a lecture about this mm-hmm. is what it is. So we, we need to deliver that content. And please know <laughs> that, you know, and this is for all the listeners, I'm not anti-lecture. 
I just mm-hmm. think that the lecture has become the default for presenting and teaching, especially mm-hmm. in our higher education and professional settings. We don't think of the lecture as one teaching strategy in our sort of toolbox, right? We, we just yeah. kind of go to it. When really sometimes what we do needs a lecture and it's the most effective way to deliver that information and it's the most effective way for our students to learn that information. But not always. Sometimes they need to do an activity. Sometimes they need to talk about it. Sometimes they need to create something. And so I'm not anti-lecture. I, I've done lectures. I, I still break them up, but I absolutely deliver lectures. I put those together and but you will never see me deliver a 60 minute lecture without any sort of break or pause because mm-hmm. we know the way the human brain learns we have to have that those moments to yeah. break it up yeah yeah so i i'm glad you said that you weren't anti lecture only because you know i was going to ask you is there still a place for lectures in mm-hmm. adult learning and professional development and be, because it certainly certainly in my world it's very much still a default, particularly in in live, you know, in-person events, but also in the online kind of context as well. Mm-hmm. Can you talk a little bit about, you know, what the range of activities are, or the range of active learning activities are, is for, you know, the online environment as opposed to in person? Because then you can presumably make more use of all the amazing tools, you know, and technology, digital technology that's out there to support active learning. Right. Absolutely. And, you know, this this is so exciting to me. My own evolution as a professional and a scholar, I have always been all about in-person, on-site teaching and learning. Like that was what I did. That's what I love to do. I came kicking and screaming into the world of online teaching and learning. I just didn't, like, it just wasn't my wheelhouse. Mm -hmm. But the more I learned about it and the more I started to see the power of flexibility and honestly, one of the one of the things that really shifted my whole perspective about teaching and learning in in any context was becoming a parent. Because when Mm -hmm. I had my son, this was eight years ago, Mm -hmm. I started listening to podcasts for the first time. And before that, I was like. I just could not handle audio stuff. Like I couldn't, it just seems like I couldn't Mm. focus on audio books. I couldn't follow the podcast. I just couldn't find my path. But I realized the power of, of, of having that flexibility and doing it on my own time, especially having, you know, a new baby. And so Mm -hmm. I could still continue my learning, but I could do it when it worked for me. And I could do it in a lot of different ways, whether I was listening, whether I was writing notes, attending a Mm -hmm. webinar. And I really started to see the power of flexibility and choice and mode and the tools. And I was like, okay, okay, I I understand. I get it. And it has shifted everything in my entire professional like career now so that I very rarely now do on-site, face-to-face, in-person events. And I've really moved into the online space and mobile learning and micro learning and we can talk mm-hmm. about that later but I've just yeah. really started to try to embrace a new way of teaching and learning and I love the flexibility of it and and so that was just kind of my personal story and personal journey but but I think you're right there there are just so many tools out there right now that can help us do what we want to do in teaching and learning and you know I I did my first virtual summer conference back in 2020 and so I I I was planning it in 2019 before the whole pandemic and everything. Mm-hmm. And I was like ready to go. And I remember at that time I was like, okay, the last thing I need to do, I've got every, I got all my speakers lined up. I have my videos ready. The last thing I needed to do was to do like closed captioning, like transcription and closed captioning. And okay. I could not find, I couldn't find anybody to like, I had to do it live. And now oh. we can hit one button and it's done. Yeah. <laughs> right? yeah. So I think it's amazing that we have so many tools that make, make our learning accessible, convenient, flexible, engaging. You know, we have quizzing tools, polling tools, chat. (laughs) We have so many things that make it so that we can uh, bring that learning to life. Absolutely. And, and of course, some of the things that you've talked about there, particularly closed captioning, you know, really serve inclusion in a way that it's been challenging to do up until the last, you know, two or three years when there's been this explosion of technology to 
you know, really facilitate different, you know, learners with different abilities and capacities to have access to material, you know, through different different avenues. So let's talk a little bit about outcomes and the relationship between active learning and learning outcomes. What are you seeing in your world in terms of, you know, enhancement, improvement, change in the quality of outcomes that you see amongst adult learners? Yeah, that's this is a great a great question and I I see it from a couple of different points of view and perspectives. You know, one is from the educator's perspective and and one is if you know what your learning outcomes are. If you can align your learning outcomes and your uh, active learning strategies or learning experiences to your assessments, then you're going to create a well-designed course that that is it's it's aligned. It makes sense to your learners. It makes sense to you. You're teaching what you are valuing. You're measuring what you're valuing, and you are you you have a course that it doesn't have those surprises that make it frustrating for students. You know, I'm, I'm sure we've all been in a class where you, you see the test and you're like, well, she didn't cover this, <laughs> you know, oh, or yeah. <laughs> we never talked about this. Well, you know, if you are working through your learning outcomes and you're aligning your activities, like you're starting with like, here's my learning outcome. Or if you're going to do backwards course design, start with the end in mind and figure mm -hmm. out what's the end goal and say, I want my students to be able to do this, or I want the professionals in my field to be able to do this. Then you think about, okay, what activities will help them get there? And that guides you towards, you know, what learning outcomes matter most to you. And mm -hmm. so just in terms of the overall course design, the structure, the experience of your learners, that just that whole process makes everything transparent, which transparency mm -hmm. is a huge deal in education. We, we are all talking about that. And then the other perspective is the retention, right? Mm -hmm. The retention and engagement, knowing that I have this learning outcome. And we have addressed it from several different points of view. And you mentioned inclusion, which we can come back to. You know, mm -hmm. we've addressed it from several different points of view. Our students have listened to a lecture. They have also watched a video. They've completed a series of quizzes. They have done a project-based assignment. We've done a case study. Like if you've done all that to support your most important learning outcomes, then your students are absolutely going to retain that information. And the same thing applies to professionals in our field. If we are going in, because we all are, we, this is how we learn, <laughs> you know, so right. we need that repeated exposure. We need to go in depth in some cases, some things we don't need to go in depth on. And so, you know, as we are thinking about actually doing the work of learning, and you know, my favorite quote is, you know, the one who does the work does the learning. And that right mm. there is, is yeah. just transformative, <laughs> you know, and so you've got to put your your professionals, your learners, whoever that is to work to do that heavy lifting. And that right there shows you if they know it or not so that you know if what you're doing is working. Well, let's talk about that heavy lifting a little bit, because, uh, you know, one of the kind of pushbacks I sometimes see in and I, you know, offer teaching and training for medical writers who are specializing in uh, continuing medical education. You know, sometimes you see a little bit of pushback in terms of and this may be a demographic issue. It might be associated with lots of things. We could talk about that. But I'm showing up for this course and I am expecting you to tell me everything that I need to know. Don't ask me to do the work. <laughs> Don't ask me mm -hmm. to get in a group and work through a problem or uh, do too many quizzes or uh, that sort of thing. Do you see that in the work that you do? This episode of Write Medicine is brought to you by Write CME Pro, a membership-driven community that provides skills, scaffolding, and support for medical writers who want to create CME content with confidence. Write CME Pro gives you access to expert perspectives to help you build your CME writing skills, a portfolio accelerator to hold space so that you can create stunning samples to show your prospects, group coaching to help you build foundational and expert knowledge in CME and more. Write CME Pro is a community for people like you who are ready to grow their CME writing niche or niche, if that's how you say it. See the show notes for more details.
I do. <laughs> My mentors, Richard Felder and Rebecca Brent, they are, they've been doing this work for many, many, many years. And they're, they focus on teaching in STEM disciplines. Mm. And so they support faculty in that, in that area. But right at the beginning of my career, I encountered an article written, written by them. And it was about comparing active learning to the stages of grief. Now, I'm not minimizing the stages mm. of grief, but this was very enlightening for me. And it, it stayed with me for 20 years. Mm -hmm. And what it is, is that like at first when our, I'm going to just, when we first go into a setting and we are you know, our, our expectation is, oh, I'm going to listen to this person on the stage. I'm going to take my notes and then I'm going to go on about my way or maybe I take an exam. That's our expectation. Mm -hmm. When we disrupt that, <laughs> something happens where we're like, wait, we want to put you in groups or wait, we want you to pause for a second and think about how you would actually apply this in what your, your field is. We are kind of disrupting that expectation and, and moving away from the norm. And so what he does, what Professor uh, Richard Felder does is compares it to the stages of grief by saying, well, at first, there's sort of this reaction of shock, like, oh, I can't believe, I can't believe this. I can't believe this yep. person is asking me to do this activity, <laughs> right? And then they perhaps might even move to the stage of anger, which is like, uh, I pay you to teach me or I paid to come right. to this conference to hear you. Yeah. So, you know, and, and that's, a, that's, a, that's part of the process. So you get this resistance and we see mm -hmm. this in active learning in, in college classrooms, right? The students who don't want to participate or are actively like, no, I'm not going to join that group. So they just very much resist that. Mm -hmm. And then we start to move towards a place perhaps where there's some isolation where you have uh, perhaps a professional who's in the audience who's like, yeah, no, I'm not going to do this activity. And they just kind of pull away. They mm -hmm. scroll on their phone or they read an article or they just totally check out. They just isolate themselves. And we see it in the college classroom where students are just like, yeah, can I just do this project on my own? I don't want to work with a group. <laughs> right. And we see this. And then, you know, we struggle in that place. And then what we hope is that we're moving them to a place of acceptance where they also value the journey. Mm -hmm. And they understand why we are doing this the way we're doing it. Perhaps it includes sharing the evidence of what we know about how people learn. Uh, and that when you are the one who's doing that heavy lifting and doing that work, you mm -hmm. are the one that's doing the learning. Mm -hmm. And now, of course, things like motivation play a huge role here. Are people coming in? Are, are they here because they want to be? Are they here because they've been told to be? <laughs> Those are two yeah. very different audiences. <laughs> and so, you know, we have to think about that as well. But but I think it's really interesting to look at it through that lens because we have all of those people in our audiences when we are presenting. Yeah, absolutely. I think it's a really interesting lens. And it does strike me that, you know, something happened to particularly thinking about higher education in particular versus, you know, professional development. Something happened in the 1980s to really make a shift from learning as a process of development to learning as a form of consumption. Mm hmm. Mm -hmm. So that, you know, among college students in particular, there, there seemed to emerge this expectation that, as you put it, you know, I'm, I'm paying you for my education. Educate me. <laughs> right. And certainly in, in my field, in CME, the, the, the motivational aspect is really important because there's a lot of external pressure on uh, health professionals to, you know, acquire their continuing education credits. They have to do that to maintain their licensure. And so for many professionals that can feel like, you know, it's a bit of a checkbox, a checklist. I have to, I have to do this. I'll do it. I'll go and sit, but you know, <laughs> don't, don't expect me to do more than I need to do. I'm already busy enough. Right. And so, you know, you, you, you talked a little bit about inclusion and I think this issue is, is part of that because inclusion is a, is a big enough concept to hold a lot of things. How can educators use active learning experiences to really build inclusion and pull people into the, the orbit of the things that they, you know, need to be learning. Oh, I love, I love this. And inclusion is, is the, the big sort of buzzword, but it's also sort of very foundational and fundamental in what we do. <laughs> it's getting a lot of attention these days. And so, you know, when I hear the word inclusion, I think of sort of four big buckets of things that you can do. And there may be more, 
Um, I'm certainly not an expert in inclusion. I'm very much on a journey learning every day, something new that I can do to improve, mm. you know, what I do in my own field. But I think one is through the lens of uh, universal design for learning, which I'm not sure if, if this has made its way to your audience yet, but really it's thinking about all the different ways that you can engage your audience, how you can represent information and material, and how your audience can then express that back to you and show what they know. Mm. And my colleague, Dr. Thomas Tobin, he's probably the best. Well, there's many people that UDL do UDL work, but he's the one I've, I've talked with the most, and he's really been helping me understand what it means. And I think my biggest take-home message from him is just when you are designing a learning experience for whatever audience it might be, uh, he uses a term called plus one, which mm -hmm. means just mm -hmm. add one more way for people to do the thing, whatever, the, whatever oh, that is. That. Yeah. And I thought this was great because it can be, get very complicated very quickly. And then people feel like, oh, I can't possibly do this. It feels very heavy. Mm -hmm. But if you just ask yourself, what's the one more thing I can do? So if you're doing a podcast, then maybe you provide a transcript. Mm -hmm. That's the plus one. So someone can read it or they can listen. Another one would be if you are standing on a stage and you're presenting, you have your slides, perhaps there's also a screen that's behind you and it has your closed captioning running like right behind you and live in real time. Perhaps that's right. something that the event can set up. If not, perhaps you can provide a printed outline of what you are talking about so people can write it down and have that with them. You know, another way is to offer choice uh, with assignments and activities. And so if you are leading professional development, maybe a workshop for a full day or something like that, maybe your participants have the opportunity to choose tracks or pads or topics or even how they want to participate where you could say, hey, if you don't want to get in groups and talk about this, mm -hmm. then you can fill this out in our collaborative Google Doc. Log in Ooh, here. I love that. Right? <laughs> yeah. yeah. So like those are just easy. You still get the engagement, but people are mm -hmm. kind of coming into it wherever they feel most comfortable. So that's just a few ways. But I mean, mm -hmm. I highly, highly recommend for your audience to check out the Universal Design for Learning because that really did shift my whole perspective about what it is that I do and how I do it. Another bucket would be, of course, DEI when we're talking about mm -hmm. diversity, equity, and inclusion. And that is a huge piece of, of the pie as well when we're talking yeah. about inclusion. And mm -hmm. that's everything from, you know, again, with it being, it could be thinking about, you know, if you have a stack of journal articles that your audience needs to read before they come to your session, have you looked at the scholars? Like, are they representative of, an, of a whole population? that you want to represent? Are you bringing in perhaps underrepresented or minority voices? Or are all of your scholars who wrote these articles the same gender or the same background or the same level of profession? Are they all full professors? Are they all mm -hmm. tenured? Like, who are these people that you are bringing in their voices into your classroom or your session? Yeah. And so even something that simple can, can be huge for inclusion. You know, and also, of course, we all think about our images that we put on our slides and in our handouts mm -hmm. and making sure that yeah. those are representative and inclusive as well. And everything also like flexibility and choice. Uh, you mm -hmm. know, I, I try to always build into my professional development workshops choice. So when people come to any like a workshop or I design something for a campus, I have almost what I call a choose your own adventure. So everybody kind of completes mm -hmm. module one and then I give them like three choices for, you know, hey, if you teach large classes, you might check this out. Or if you're interested in how to ask effective questions, go here. If you're interested right. in more active learning strategies and assessment, go here. So they can kind of customize that. And that's a great mm -hmm. way to be inclusive as well and honor, you know, their backgrounds. And then the other two is just uh, we don't have to talk about those here, but one would be psychological safety and trust, right. really yeah. building that. Yeah. And I mean, that's huge right now, because especially if yeah, if your profession has very controversial topics and issues that might start a debate that could spin mm -hmm. off into an unhealthy place, we want to manage and control that. So how do you build that trust? And then mm -hmm. the last one is physical. Do we do we physically feel safe in our professional learning environments? And, mm -hmm. you know, I'm definitely not an expert there, but that you know, so I guess I feel like inclusion is all of those things. Can people physically access the space where we're teaching learning and do they feel safe in those spaces when they're there? So I guess I think of inclusion as a, 
a, it's just a, it's big, it is big. <laughs> I, you know, it is it's big. big. And I look at it from all these perspectives, but active learning in the research has continued to show that when you use it, especially in the STEM disciplines, that you do have an increase in the success rates and the retention of underrepresented and minority populations. And we've seen this, especially with women in the sciences mm -hmm. and also with minority populations as well. And that has been published pretty recently, and it just continues to show up in the research over and over again. So those are really, really helpful buckets with a lot of practical information about how you can operationalize those buckets as well. And I, I love the emphasis on, uh, you know, what you said about, you know, looking at your reading list and looking at the voices that, that you're representing, because that also gives you a way to to take different perspectives and uh, to look at the same topic from through different lenses. Mm -hmm. So it, it's, it, it almost kind of, you know, offers double duty in terms of that inclusion piece, you know, including a range of voices, but also those voices are kind of critical to really thinking about the topic that you're focusing on. Absolutely. There's an activity. And, uh, you know, if you have show notes, we can put it there. It's called the Six Thinking Hats Oh, from the De Bono group. I did not create this activity, but I love this activity because you mm -hmm. are literally asking your audience to wear different color hats, mm -hmm. quote unquote, just theoretical hats. And from yeah. each of those mm -hmm. hats, they bring a different perspective. They're supposed it's, it's, it's almost like a role play or an assigned mm -hmm. role play. But mm -hmm. you can do so much with it once you have the foundation. So, you know, you have like a, a green hat. And if you're wearing the green hat, you need to bring to the to the, the scenario uh, possibilities you've never even considered before. If you wear a red hat, you're supposed to bring like the alerts or the concerns, you know, that we need to think about. And I've used this in, in professional development workshops where the very first question, once I introduced what the thinking hats were, the very first question was something very relevant to something that that campus was considering. Like we could say right now, I'm not sure about chat GPT and artificial intelligence, mm -hmm. but that's like blowing up right now across yep. higher education. Yeah. And so, you know, the opening question could be that. And then all of a sudden people are like, yes, talk about motivated. Of course, we're motivated. It's totally relevant. Everybody's going to have an opinion <laughs> and a perspective. Yeah. And so mm -hmm. if they're wearing these different color hats, they can really start to break down their own biases, mm -hmm. perhaps to this and really explore it. And then when you bring in reading and observations and materials and interviews and podcasts from other voices, it just mm -hmm. really enriches that. So yeah, I'm happy I to love that. send you the, I'll send you the link to that because it's a great little uh, framework for, for that. And this activity. is Edward de Bono, right? Yes. Yes. Yeah. Okay, great. Um, no, I, I, I love, uh, I love his work. His, mm -hmm. I actually, random fact, I think he, I think he has a brother when I was training as a, as a student nurse. <laughs> In Scotland in the in the eighties, his brother was a consultant in the hospital where I trained. So cool. there you go. <laughs> Six <laughs> degrees world. of separation. <laughs> absolutely. Absolutely. I, I just really uh the, the framework is, is awesome. And if you're looking for something, or, or even if it inspires you to come up with your own activity or interpretation yeah. of it, it's a great way to to kind of click the box and say, you know what, this is relevant, this is meaningful, this is this is not dumbing down the material, which I know is a mm -hmm. big concern for people who use active mm -hmm. learning. We're not doing that at all. You're making it relevant. You're making it engaging. Mm -hmm. And that's what matters. And you're making it bite sized. And, and I'll make this my last question because I'm conscious of our time, Barbie, and it's, it's mm -hmm. kind of later for you than it is for me in the day. But you did touch on micro learning. And I know that you use micro learning in your own teaching. You have an app that you use to support your learning. Can you just talk a little bit about the value of micro learning for adult learners in professional development? Yeah, so this is new for me. This is new for me. So I've been I've been doing this uh this reading about it and learning about it for the last a couple of years and trying to think about what uh, mobile learning means and micro learning which they usually go hand in hand, not necessarily but usually. So when we think about what mobile learning is, it's usually done like on your phone. Typically that's the mobile device that's being used and you know, again, becoming a parent just changed everything about the way that I I learn and continue mm -hmm. my own professional development. And my phone is where it happens now. Like I probably do mm -hmm. 80% of my professional development on my phone. That's where I take my notes. I use note apps. I listen to podcasts. I listen to webinars. I don't even watch them anymore. I just listen to them, mm -hmm. you know? And so I started thinking to myself over the last year or two, 
why can't we do this in faculty development? Now, we do see micro learning and mobile learning in nursing education. I did have a nurse on my podcast who talked about this work, but I haven't seen this in in my work where we're talking mm-hmm. about faculty development, teaching, learning, and higher education. And so I am going to step into this world. and I'm so excited to uh, launch my new Lecture Breakers Academy, and that is included in it. I have a program called Your Teaching Coach, and it is literally mm. 10 modules, and they are bite-sized modules. They take two to two minutes to complete. Mm-hmm. They're engaging. Some of them include assessment questions. Some you're scrolling and kind of thinking through. Some you're writing, doing some reflection. So I'm very much trying to model that active learning piece mm. on a mobile device. Uh, and then it connects to our community where you can go deeper, ask questions. And then there's a library of, of videos where you're like, hey, I want to learn more about that thing. I'm going to go find mm-hmm. it. So I'm really trying to embrace the fact that faculty and professionals are busy when it comes to learning and continuing mm-hmm. their learning. And that also they bring expertise and experience. So like they should be able to customize their journey through, you know, yeah. uh, this process and, and honor and respect the fact that they have 20 years of experience teaching. Mm-hmm. So that's what I've created. I think that the idea of things being bite size, relevant, uh, practical, mm-hmm. you know, I can learn this thing and then I can try it. I can experiment and adapt it for my class. Mm. Or for my audience, I think that that's very important for all professionals and and even for students. So we're we're also looking at mobile learning with our students as well, and just kind of thinking about what what this means because so many people have a powerful computer right there in their pocket, <laughs> you know. So absolutely. it's like, how, how can we leverage this, you know, for for learning? Yeah, absolutely. And the the kind of point of care learning has been building in in uh, you know health professionals education for for a mm-hmm. number of years now, and exactly that idea that you need to learn at the point of practice, uh, the point of care, and so to be able to kind of whip out your phone and learn what you need to apply in the moment. Mm-hmm in a way that is, you know, accessible and quick and evidence-based, so important for, you know, education, educating health professionals Mm -hmm. is, is something that, you know, there's a little bit of that, but there's certainly scope for, for more. Did you build your own app, by the way? I did not. I'm using, um, I'm partnered with EdApp, which is a, a group that does the mobile learning and does it in a lot of professional contexts and a lot of training and development as well. And uh, and I was like, you know what, I haven't seen this. And so let's give it a try. So I worked with an instructional designer and partnered with them and we built it and tested it over the last year or so. So yeah, it's so what, I, what I've created is kind of a balance. So if you learn best by watching the webinars and engaging with others where you're having a conversation, then we have that, that's the community. And then within that community, you can click download the app and then there's where your micro lessons are and you can you can complete those as fast as you want to. You could do one a day or you can do 10 a day, you know, whatever right. works for you. And yeah. then we have, you know, conversations and coaching to back that up. And I think that balance is really important because you not only have the content, but you have the connection. I love that you called it a point of care, point of care mm-hmm. learning, because I haven't heard that. I've heard it called just in time teaching where it's mm-hmm. like uh, right now I need this thing and here it is. And now I'm going to learn how to do it. Really interesting. Yeah. So thank you for giving me some new language to bring to this. Yeah. And I'll try and uh, remember to, or remind me if I forget, uh, you know, share a couple of references just to kind of parse that out a little bit. Yeah. Barbie Honeycutt, lecture breaker, active learning advocate. Thank you so much for sharing your insights and wisdom with listeners of Right Medicine. It's been an absolute delight. Well, thank you. This has been wonderful. I love the work you're doing. Thank you so much for inviting me on your podcast. I, anytime we can talk about teaching and learning, no matter if it's, you know, for students or professionals or for ourselves, I I love to do that. So again, thank you so much for having me on your show. Oh, you're very welcome. My pleasure. If you'd like to connect with me or today's guest or access any of the resources we talked about, check out the show notes for this episode. They're on my website, where you'll also find additional resources. Find the show notes at alexhausen.com forward slash write, W-R-I-T-E dash medicine dash podcast. And while you're there, don't forget to subscribe to the Write Medicine newsletter 
where you'll find bi-weekly tips, tools and resources to help you create continuing medical education content with confidence. And thank you for listening today. Word of mouth is the most meaningful way we can help listeners find us and reach a wider audience. So please share this episode with a friend, a colleague or a client who might find the podcast helpful. And if you enjoy listening to the podcast, please write a favourable review on Apple Podcasts or Spotify. Or share your testimonial on the dedicated testimonial link, which is also in the show notes.